Well, happy Mother's Day. I'm so glad you all are here today. Let's give a round of applause for all of our mothers. Let's hear it for them. Woo! All right, and welcome everybody online. Happy Mother's Day to everybody who's watching today. And uh, we want to honor our moms today. It's a special, special day. And by the way, if you are a guest with us or visitor or you're watching online for the first time or you're here with your mom or we are just so glad you're here with us here at New Point Church. If you don't have a church home, we'd love for you to come and get plugged in here. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we just want to welcome, welcome you today. I know that sometimes today's uh, Mother's Day is a tough day for some, maybe because you've have, have, a, have a lost parent or a lot, you've lost a, a mom or a dad and so you're without on this Mother's Day. Maybe you've lost a child and it's a difficult day. Maybe your childhood was, was really difficult and so it makes Mother's Day every year really tough as well. And I just want to say that we acknowledge that and we, we, are, um, we just pray that today that God would bring comfort to you no matter where you're at or what you've walked through. And so we acknowledge that. And I know that Mother's Day isn't always what is cut out, should be, should be for every, every mom. But today we want to honor our moms um, no no matter where you're at in that spectrum, um, and, and know that we're praying for you and we love you moms today. What we want to do, though, is we want to honor our moms today by giving away a gift. We've got a gift package. I've got it up here. We've got, man, doesn't this look great? My wife did this, by the way. I didn't. So the presentation. So we've got a massage we're going to be giving away to one lucky mom. We've got a diamond nutrition uh, gift certificate. We've got um, all kinds of other stuff in here. But we want to give this away to one lucky, lucky mom today. But however, we, uh, we, we kind of had a blunder on, on, our, on our little uh, uh, giveaway slip. So if you have that yellow card, and if you didn't get one, raise your hand. But if you have that yellow card, if you're, you're uh, a mom, oh, it's green. <laughs> I'm colorblind. It's green. Uh, you have the green card. There's nothing on it. It's just blank. So I'm hoping that some of you figured out maybe to write your name on there, um, right? Or, or draw a picture and we can identify you from that. I don't know. But anybody need a green card to write their name on or put it in the basket before we draw? Anybody? Anybody? All right. Let's go ahead, Cody. Come on up here. Come on, Vanna. <laughs> We're going to draw one lucky mom today to get this basket and... Uh, I'll mix them up. Oh, oh, yes, go over there. We'll get you another one in. We don't want to let any mom go. We're going to give away one in this service, one in the next one. We got a couple over here as well. There we go. Now they're coming. I think people are padding the deck right now. I think that's what's happening. They found some extra cards somewhere. They're padding the deck. Anybody else need one? We'll take time. I want to make sure everybody gets an opportunity to, to, to win this. Oh, we got one over here. Anybody over here? Hey, but it's a little bit of 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 a little Maybe some of y'all were waiting to see what we we're giving away first. Maybe that's what it was. <laughs> You're like, I'm just going to wait and see. By the way, everybody online, I'm sorry. This one giveaway, you got to be here in person to win. We're good? Anybody else? Final calls? Going once? Going twice? All right. All right. And the winner is... Donna Mers. All right, here you go. Take that to her. Congratulations, Donna. Welcome, and we honor you today. You will put that to good use. So great. That is awesome. Well, welcome again to Mother's Day. And I want to jump into kind of the word that the Lord's given me to speak and to preach to you today. And so I just want to say this, that I know that sometimes on Mother's Day, we kind of gear the message a little bit towards moms. But really, as I was preparing this and thinking through this, this message really is for everybody. I think we all need to hear what God's Word says uh, today, not just to moms, but also to all of us, because the principles that we find in Scripture today are principles for every person, every person. I know the principles that I need to hear today as well. And so as we walk through this, um, I just want you to hear what God has for you. So let me pray for us, and I'll jump in to the Word today. God, thank you for who you are. 
Thank you that you are a faithful father, that you're a caring and loving God. Thank you for our moms. Thank you for those ladies and women in our life that you've provided with us. And God, I know that today can be a day that's difficult for some, but also it can be a great day of, of uh, celebration for some. But no matter where we're at, Lord, I pray you would be comforter. That you'd come alongside of us and you'd bring comfort, you'd bring peace. And God, that you would just allow this day to be a wonderful day of honor. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Being a mom is hard, right? I, I, I laughed at that video because I, I've heard my, my, uh, my wife uh, say those things. And I remember as a child, I remember, like, I probably found myself in every one of those scenarios as I was asking my mom for things and et cetera. And it's just kind of funny uh, to see how much demand there is on a mom. And, and the bar has been set incredibly high. It's like everybody wants something from mom all at the same time, whether it's kids or a spouse or whether it's a community, uh, a community group that you're a part of. Like everybody wants something from, from mom all at the same time. And not only that, you add to that the pressures of social media, right? As you look out across social media and you see all these perfect mom posts or perfect family posts of everybody posting their, their stylized version of their life, they're not posting the, the vomit they have on the back of their head in the car ride, right? They're not posting that. They're posting, you know, the cute pics of their children. And it, and it seems like, like we have this infinite standard that moms have to live up to. It's like the bar of motherhood is set so high. And then it's like, it's like the perfect mother is a mirage, so just when you think you're about to get there, it's gone and you never can reach it. And so I want to take some of the pressure off today a little bit because we, we, we have the problem, not just moms, but all of us have this problem of comparison, right? We, we all see what else is out there and we compare our life or compare our duties or compare how we're doing with other people. We do that. I want to remind you and remind myself of something that Cheyenne and I say to our kids all the time. Here's what we say. We say, if you keep comparing yourself to others, you'll never be happy. Like that's, a, that's like a daily occurrence in my household. And I thought about that. I'm like, man, what a great word for us, especially in the day and age that we live. If we continue to compare ourselves to others, and moms, you need to hear this. If you continue to compare yourself to other moms, or at least the fake version of other moms, we'll never be content. And, and that's kind of one of the main things that we're going to talk about today is that comparison is the enemy of contentment. As long as we compare, we'll never find contentment. And God wants to free us from that today. Now, I just want to be real with you, because I know my own wife. If I were to tell you to stop comparing yourself, you guys would just laugh at me, right? Because you know you're not going to stop. You know it's just something that's going to happen and that you're going to face with, uh, you're going to be faced with. And so rather than just try to stop you compare to, from comparing, because I've tried, and then I, I remember my wife always looking on social media and seeing all of our friends' cute little decorated birthday parties and all that. And then I, she tries to kind of keep up with all that. And by the way, all of our friends have a lot of kids. So there's a lot of birthday parties to try to keep up with. And, uh, and, and so I know, that, I know that even when I tell her, I'm like, stop, stop. You don't have to do that, you know? I know she won't. She'll just keep trying to, trying to do her best, right, at every, everything all the time. So here's what I want to do. Rather than tell you to stop comparing, which I hope you do, but I know it's not reality, I'm going to tell you today who to compare yourself with. How about that? How about I give you a target? I give you a goal. Like, ladies, if you're going to compare yourself to someone, and in fact, everybody here, whether you're male or female, if we're going to compare ourselves, let's look at this for a moment because I want to give you a person to compare yourself to. How about Mary, the mother of Jesus? Now, I know a lot of the ladies are like, Pfft. All right, Kyle, thanks. The mother of Jesus. I'm going to compare myself to her. All right, the mother of our Savior. Thanks, like I lowered the bar any, okay? But not so fast. Today as we look at her story, as we look at who she is, really within context, I truly believe we're going to find some things that all of us are going to gain from today. So let's jump in. Matthew chapter 1. This is actually the birth account of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 1, we read these few verses. Verse 18. It says, this then is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, 
he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now we read these verses, and for some of us they're familiar because we read them a lot of times around Christmas. It's kind of like the Christmas story, the birth of Jesus. The angels appear to Mary and the angels appear to Joseph, that you're going to have this baby boy. And all of us are like, man, she was so honored. And we think about this moment, but when we really begin to look at it, let, let's put her within her context. That, that Mary was a young teenage woman engaged to be married to a Jewish man named Joseph. And now she discovers that she's about to be pregnant and it's not with her fiancé's child. So picture yourself. Look at the story within its context. You can imagine the social stigma that she's about to encounter. What's attached to this, what is implied, is Mary's promiscuity. Because everybody else is looking at the situation to her being engaged, yet not have been with her, her, her future husband yet. So it implies that she was with somebody else. And Joseph himself kind of reads into this a little bit because he knows that this son, this, this child that she is about to have is not her own or is not his. And so um, it created doubt in his own mind. And pretty soon it was going to create some doubt in the whole community's mind. And so imagine the scandal that is surrounding the birth of our Savior Jesus for a moment. And we kind of fly through that at Christmas season without really acknowledging the weight that was upon Mary's shoulders. Because at the moment where Mary should be most honored for being chosen by God to bear a son, impregnated by a miracle through the Holy Spirit, in the midst of all of that, she's also been given kind of like a scarlet letter. Because society is going to look at her as being unfaithful to Joseph. And Joseph, as we read through, was even questioning in his own mind. And she was on the very verge of being rejected. Listen to what Joseph was doing. It says that Joseph, he, he, her husband was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. And again, we kind of just read through that because it doesn't happen. But here's what Joseph was thinking. Joseph was like, do I trust her? She's telling me this crazy story that God's given her a child. Do I really trust her in this or not? And the Old Testament law, here's what the Old Testament law for the Jews, what it allowed is that Mary, if she was promiscuous and she slept around, then actually she should and could be stoned to death for being unfaithful to her husband. So that was an option that Joseph had, was to call out and make it a big public thing and for her to be stoned to death. But the other thing that could have happened, and this is the pathway that Joseph chose or began to choose, is he, he chose to, to kind of, through a loophole, was going to divorce her quietly. Now, attached with that is all kinds of shame, all kinds of reject, because if she would be a divorced woman, then people would obviously assume why. And then she would never be married again. She would be forced to live in her own household with her own father so that her family could take care of her. And the shame would be brought upon her and her family. And so you feel today, would you just feel for a moment the weight of rejection that Mary was walking with in this moment that should have been the most honoring moment of her life. Now she also has all of these complicated feelings and emotions going on as well. Not only that, we think about all the other rejection that she's going to face. And we see this story from our vantage point, but today I want us to see it from her vantage point. This wouldn't have been easy news for her. Look what happens to the rest of the verses here in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. It says, but after he had considered this, this is Joseph considering to divorce her, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what, what, what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So in the midst of this moment of rejection, in this midst of this, this situation, God speaks up, and God brings restoration to Mary's story. Did you hear what he said? He confirmed exactly what he had told Mary, confirmed it to Joseph. Joseph is now this, this 
Joseph is being used by God is a conduit of restoration in the midst of Mary's rejection. Here's what I want you to see today. Every single one of us experienced rejection at some point in our life. And there are many of you maybe here today that you have been living under a cloud of rejection for your whole life. That you've experienced deep-seated rejection. Maybe it started early in life for some of you. You were rejected as a child, maybe from parents or maybe at school or from a friend group. Maybe for some of you, some of you women, maybe you were rejected early on as maybe you, you, like Mary, had an early pregnancy and you became rejected by society. Maybe, Maybe today that you were rejected by a significant other, like Mary was about to be. Maybe you went through a bitter divorce and so it left you feeling unwanted or unloved. Maybe for some of you parents, maybe for some of you moms, you've felt rejected by your very, very own kids at some point. Maybe for some of you, you, you felt rejected by your kids because now they've grown up and they're out of the house and you're feeling the emptiness that is there. And then for all of us, I think we can relate, but maybe we've been rejected by a job. We've been rejected by opportunity after opportunity, door slammed in our face after door slammed in our face, that we've experienced rejection in life. And so it really doesn't matter how or by whom or when rejection happened in your life, it hurts and it sticks with us. And it becomes something that we carry around as a burden. And today, here's what I know that you need to hear. You need to hear a word. And here's what God says. God restores the rejected. God restores the rejected. No matter where you find yourself today, you've got this weight on your shoulders. God wants to speak into you and say, you can be restored today. That you don't have to continue to walk in that. God knows that in this life we will experience the excruciating pain of rejection. But I want you to hear today that your rejection is not the end of the story. That God wants to bring restoration to your story. And in Mary's case, God promises to her and to Joseph. Did you hear the words? That this pain of rejection would result in the gain of the entire world. That the entire world would benefit from her pain. That because she's willing to be faithful to God by bearing this child and she's going to be going through excruciating rejection from his point forward because society isn't going to understand that in the midst of that, God's going to restore the situation to bring about restoration from her rejection. And her restoration isn't just going to be for her. It's actually going to restore the entire world. I mean, this is the story of the gospel. This is the story of the gospel. God restores The rejected. Listen to this verse in 1 Peter 5.10. Here's what God's word says. God says, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. This is what God does. When we are in connection and a relationship with Him, He walks us through a process of restoration and healing after our suffering. And through the process, He promises to make us strong, firm, and steadfast. You know, we as Christians, we we acknowledge that the, the foundation of our belief is the fact that Jesus died and rose again. It is the ultimate restoration story, right? Our God who was killed and crucified and dead in the grave has now been restored to life. And this is the gospel. The gospel message is that God wants to restore life that has been broken and battered and bruised and rejected. And God wants to do this for you. This is what becoming a Christian is all about. This is what following Jesus is all about. It's not just about how I get to heaven. It's about how I experience life on this earth right now. God wants to bring restoration. And so here's, here's my, my word to you, is that in the midst of your rejection that you've been carrying with you, maybe it's recent or maybe it's ages old, God knows the pain. He hears your cry. And so what, what, what God wants you to do is don't, don't reject Him and stiff arm Him and stay in your rejection. God wants you to move towards Him, to cry out to Him because He hears you. And in the process of your crying out to Him, God brings restoration and healing in time. God wants to bring restoration to your rejection today. 
Now, this is just looking at the birth of Jesus, but Mary also had the tough job of parenting Jesus. You think, you think parenting your teenagers is hard, right? How about parenting a teen, teenager with the ultimate God complex, right? <laughs> I'm glad you got that joke. Like, listen to this. Look at, look at Luke chapter 2, verse 41. This is the only account that we have of Jesus of his adolescent age. So we have his birth, and then we have the time when he comes into his full ministry around 30. But this is the only story we have in Scripture of him as an adolescent. He's around 12 years old. Listen to this story in Luke, in Luke uh, chapter 2, verse 41. It says, Every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. So they were a Jewish family, and every year uh, the Jews would travel to Jerusalem for this week-long celebration to honor and celebrate God bringing rescue uh, through the Passover, which was a, a celebration of God bringing rescue from Egypt, crossing through the Red Sea, etc. So they're celebrating this year in and year out. Jesus would have been a part of this. And so when, verse 42, it says, When he was 12 years old, speaking of Jesus, they went up to the festival according to their custom. And after the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. And then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. And when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. And after three Days they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. <laughs> Do you see the humor in this? Like, have you ever had one of those uh oh moments as a parent? Like, oh crap. I, I remember I had one when, when Luke, our oldest son, was around five or six, and, and we had a, a younger daughter named Madeline, and, and now she's six, but she was, I don't know, uh, around two or three at, uh, at the time, I think. And so we, we drove down to southern Oklahoma to go to Arbu Arbuckle Wilderness. And so we were there, and, and Arbuckle Wilderness is kind of like this drive-through safari, you know, zoo kind of a thing where you get to feed animals from your car, and then they have this gift shop. And so we did the drive-through thing, and, and so it's Cheyenne and I and Madeline and, and, and Luke. And, and, um, and so we do this. We stop by at the gift shop on our way out. We're hanging out at the gift shop, and then we, we all say, all right, let's go to the car. And it was busy. It was like the, the beginning of summer at the time that we went. So there were cars coming and going. It's right off the highway down to southern Oklahoma, so there's lots of traffic going. We go, get out to the car, put Madeline in her car seat. Cheyenne jumps in the car, and I look around, and I'm like, wait a second. I'm missing somebody, right? Luke was nowhere to be found. Had no idea where he was. He was gone. And, and, and our son Luke, he, he has Down syndrome as well. So it kind of complicates the matter too because he doesn't just easily follow instructions. So he was just completely gone. And now I'm thinking at this moment, oh, great, great. I'm thinking like, like flashbacks of the movie Jungle Book are coming to mind. Like with Mowgli, like as a boy raised by wolves. And I'm thinking like... like Luke, all right, great. I'm going to find ourselves on news like the story's going to be. Boy raised by alpacas at Arbuckle Wilderness, like kept alive by food pellets by passing cars, right? <laughs> Next up, interview with world's worst parents, right? So that's like what I'm thinking. And before long, like we were frantically uh, panicking, a, a mom from the gift shop comes out. Is this your child? I'm like, it's hers. It's all hers, right? <laughs> and so... We've all had those moments, right, where we've lost somebody or lost a child. And can you imagine this for a moment? Mary, Mary misplaced Jesus for three days. For three days. She had no idea where he was at. She lost him for an entire day before realizing he was missing. Can you imagine a conversation with God, like praying over those three days? Like, God, um, you know that kid you gave me? <laughs> Do you happen to have a GPS tracker on him or something? Or, or don't worry about that. What about like plan B? Is like there another, another kid you could give me? Like, like how are we going to do this? And God's like, I gave you one job, right? <laughs> one, one job. So, you know, we, we think about this. Here's, here's what we need to understand from Mary. We, like, we look at her as like the standard of perfection. But in reality, we need to understand that even Mary was human. And mistakes happen. Failures happen, but God never gives up on you, mom. God never gives up on you. You need to understand this, that God forgives failure. God forgives failure. 
And, and as we're looking at being a parent, and specifically being a mom, I think failure is built into the job description. I mean, if you had to raise some of us, failure is going to happen. We don't make it easy. Failure is built in. And for Mary, you need to understand this, that God's standard for parenting or being a mom, or God's standard isn't perfection, it's, it's, it's faithfulness. It's faithfulness. Let me give you this definition of faithfulness for a moment. Faithfulness is this. It's long obedience in the same direction. Every one of you need to hear this because some of you feel like God's standard for your life, you can never live up to it. Like God is constantly mad at you. Like God is constantly disappointed in you because you screw it up all the time. Let me just take some of the pressure off. We never can attain to God's standard because it is perfection when it comes to sinfulness. We got to be perfect, but that's why Jesus lived the life for us. He took our place, lived the life for us, so the pressure of perfection could be taken off. And now we live in a relationship with Jesus that that already has built in the fact that we're not going to get it right all the time. And so what God doesn't require of us perfection, because that's why his son came to be perfect for us, he requires faithfulness. And faithfulness doesn't mean you get it right all the time. It means that you will continue to be obedient in the same direction, that you'll continue keeping on and keeping on and keeping on, even when you go through disappointment and heartache and failure, that you will continue on in the same calling and life that God's given you. God forgives forgives failure. You need to take the pressure off and realize that if God called Mary to be the the mother of Jesus and she's not perfect, then let me just take the pressure off you that that you can honor and, and be faithful to God too. You can too. God is pleased with you. Sometimes though, here's what happens, especially for moms, that, that failure can become a prison. Like when you fail or when you don't live up to the standard or the expectation that you see out there, there's this weight that traps you in guilt and shame and fear and anxiety. Like, and and you, you convince yourself, and rather the enemy convinces you, that you'll never be able to keep up. You'll never be able to achieve what you need to achieve. That you're never doing enough. And in fact, if you can't keep up and you're not doing enough, then you naturally assume you're not enough. And so all this weight that's getting put on you is not by God. It's by the enemy who's trying to weigh you down with guilt and shame and keep you trapped so that you can't uh, feel the forgiveness that God really wants to give you. You need to hear this word today, Romans 8.1. Here's what it says. All of us need to hear this. This doesn't just apply to moms. Therefore, there is now, say it with me, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Jesus died not only to set us free from sin and the penalty of sin, He died to set us free from condemnation, not from only from the Lord, but condemnation from the enemy and condemnation from our peers. God releases us. He gives us freedom and forgiveness when we fail. So just take the, take the bar and lower it a bit. Take the pressure off. Because we're living under a standard that we have put there, not God. Listen, God does not call you to perfection. He calls you to progression. This is that idea of long obedience in the same direction. He didn't call you to be perfect now, like immediately. Uh, he, he knows you're going to have issues. You're, you're going to have hiccups. You're going to have blunders. Mary had a huge one. But he didn't call her to perfection. He called her to progression. And God often uses our failure to grow us to be who he wants us to be. Like, I think that God is kind of comical in this way. He will always give us a little bit tougher children than we can handle, (laughs) right? A little bit tougher spouse situation, a little bit tougher financial situation, a little bit tougher you, you whatever, because God wants to continue to grow us. Because if we could do it on our own, we wouldn't need him, right? But he wants us to pursue him in the midst of our failure so we can be forgiven, but also be living in a close relationship with him. Parenting is one of the greatest tools God uses to bring about our own spiritual growth. Too often we look at it as parenting is a curse that God has given us, right? All right, let's just be honest, really. Come on. But it's a blessing. And the difficult of parenting is actually a blessing. 
And the failures of parenting is actually a blessing. Failure isn't final. It's a process of God building and growing you. You know what? When I look at this story, I think this parenting blunder with Mary, I think it's why we don't have any other stories of Jesus' adolescence or teenage. You know, we don't, we don't have any other stories until he's 30. Why? Because I think you and I threaten our kids with grounding them till adults, but I think Mary did it. Right? I think she said, Jesus, you can't go nowhere. All right? Nowhere. Like the first event that Mary and Jesus go to, like it's a, it's a party at a wedding, and guess who's with Jesus? Mary. Like she was probably holding his hand, like the ultimate helicopter mom, and he's 30 years old. And in fact, the first miracle, it wasn't even Jesus' idea, it was Mary. She's like, come on, son, you can do it. It's time now. It's time. It's time. I'll let you go. You're 30 now. You need to move out of the house, do your own thing. Right? Mary was not the perfect mom, but nobody is. Yet God trusted her and entrusted her with the Savior of the world. That speaks volumes to how much God loves you. And I know that parenting Jesus is full of all kinds of difficulties as we look at this, but the hardest part of parenting Jesus, being the mother of Jesus, must have been this. Mary had to watch her own son be crucified. Look at, look at this verse in John. We find the story goes, Jesus has now been flogged, whipped, tortured, hung on a cross. The cross is raised in the air and he's being tortured and killed and being crucified. And in John chapter, John chapter 19, we hear these words. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, whose also name was Mary, wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. By the way, names in the Bible are confusing. There are three Marys in this one verse. Mary, Mary's sister Mary, and then Mary's friend Mary, Right? If you met a woman, you could just be like, Mary, right? Mary, <laughs> right? You probably just assume. But Mary is at the foot of the cross watching her son be crucified. Imagine the pain of loss that she's about to endure. I, think, I don't think that Mary had some kind of insight for all of these years that she knew this was going to happen. I think maybe she knew that Jesus was special. She, he was given by God to do great things, maybe even the Son of God. But I don't think she got the full picture. And so this is, this, this is so painful. In fact, we know that Mary didn't know that he was going to be raised from the dead because a day after he was crucified and buried in the tomb, she actually goes there to, to basically to, to, to continue to keep him from stinking. She's finishing the preparations for the burial. She's, she's going to go and finish the job because she's not expecting him to be resurrected. And so the pain that she was going through, she must have been crushed. She must have been crushed by all this. But in the midst of this story, we see that Jesus is hanging on the cross, getting ready to breathe his last. You know what Jesus' priority is in the midst of his death? Listen to the next few verses here. The next few verses. In 28, we may not have it on there, but I'll go ahead and read it. Or verse 26 and 27, there we go. So when, when Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved, which we, we assume is probably John, so Jesus is, 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 on, is on the cross. Mary is there watching her son be crucified. Then John is there standing nearby. He said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. See, in the midst of Jesus' own crucifixion and suffering, you know what he does? He attaches his mom to one of his faithful disciples and he cares for her in the midst of his own death. Jesus makes sure that she is comfort in, comforted in the midst of her being crushed at the loss of her son. Isn't that interesting? He, he's thinking about his mom's own comfort. Here's what I want you to understand today. God comforts the crushed. Some of you today in the room, some of you maybe even watching online, you've experienced excruciating pain in this life excruciating loss. Maybe you have the loss of a parent. 
Maybe you lost a parent early on in life and the pain of that. Maybe you just recently lost a parent. Maybe you experienced the loss of a child, the pain of that. I've never had to go through that, but I've officiated several families who've lost children. It's probably one of the greatest pains you could ever walk through. Maybe you've lost a close friend. You've just been crushed. And maybe you're still crushed. No matter how many years go by, you are still crushed. Maybe you've experienced the loss of your own childhood. Like your childhood wasn't any childhood that anybody would hope to have. It was just a, a bad childhood. And so you experienced that loss and you had to grow up too soon and you're walking around in that. Maybe, maybe you experienced loss when your children to grow up and get out of the house and now your home's empty and you don't know what to do and it's almost like you've lost a child. Maybe, maybe you, you're, you're enduring the, maybe a, a prodigal child. Maybe one of your children or some of your children have, have literally run away or run away from the faith or run away from the way that you raised them and just the weight of that loss on you today. God knows what it feels like to experience loss. And in these moments, God has human qualities as well and He is also watching and experiencing the, the crushing blow of His own child, Jesus, being crucified and killed. Mary knew the crushing weight of loss as well. And here's what we need to understand in those moments that you feel crushed, God brings comfort. He wants to comfort you today in the midst of everything you're dealing with. Psalm 23, it's one of my favorite psalms. Here's what it says. It's very familiar to most of us. It says, the Lord, David's writing this, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. For a moment, just just pay attention to that word. God refreshes your soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Now listen to these final verses. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know, other translations translate this, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. When we experience loss, it's as if we're in this valley of the shadow of death. Like there's this shadow, there's this deep valley that is just darkness. And some of you have found yourself there now that you don't know what to do with the loss that you have. You can't see any light. You don't think there's any way out. And what God does, God doesn't look at you from afar and say, man, Sorry for her her loss, his loss. God comes into the midst of the valley with you to be your shepherd, to refresh your soul. And as we look at these verses up on the screen, it says that, that he brings us comfort. But here's the thing that we need to understand. Because some of us pray and pray and pray, God, heal them. God, restore them. God, change the situation. God, fix this. But God's promise is not to us that he's always going to restore our loss or bring back your loved one or change your situation. You know what his promise is? His promise is his presence. His promise is his presence. For me, I haven't experienced the tremendous loss that some of you have had by having someone die. But for me, I I know what loss feels like. On some levels, I can relate. When, when Shine and I were, were pregnant, when she was pregnant with our first child, Luke, I've already, already kind of shared with you a little bit about him, but, but we were so excited. Shine and I were both athletes growing up, and we were getting ready to have our first baby boy, and so we have all these dreams for Luke to be like this, this athlete to follow in our footsteps. We're so excited for him, and all through the pregnancy, Shine was super healthy. Everything was going good, and, and we actually moved to Ponca City two weeks before she gave birth to Luke. And so, um, and so we, we go in to, to, to give birth to Luke, and, and Luke is born, had a few, uh, anyway, so, so he's born, he comes out, and the doctors kind of clean him up, and the doctors begin to do some tests and run some tests. And in that moment, our whole world was shaken. Because what the doctors came back and reported to us, they say, hey, Kyle and Cheyenne, I, I need to tell you that, that we think Luke has Down syndrome. For us, in that moment, we're like, what is that? And we began to really realize what it was. And in that moment, it was like the death of all of our dreams and all of our hopes for Luke's life and for our life was completely shattered. It was just lost. Over the next two weeks, they ran more tests just to make sure. And sure enough, the tests came back conclusive that Luke had Down syndrome. 
we were heartbroken. We were heartbroken. And we felt at that moment that we were in the deepest, darkest valley of our life because we didn't know what his health, what his life, what his future was going to be like. We know it wasn't going to be anything like we had hoped or dreamed for. I mean, it was hard, incredibly hard to go through that. Luke is 10 now, beautiful, bright red hair, fun kid. What we've experienced over the last 10 years in this valley is exactly what God promises to every single one of us. Because God doesn't promise us that he's going to heal Luke or change his situation or change our situation. But what is God's promise? It's his presence. And I can tell you with 100% certainty that we have experienced God's presence in the valley way more than we ever would have on the mountaintop. He has been there. God has, has done that infinitely more. He has restored my joy. He has, he has, he has brought uh, the ability to dream again. God has restored hope in me for the future. He's done that in the midst of the deepest pain that we thought we could have experienced. At some point, here's what happened over those last 10 years. I quit praying for God to change it or heal Luke. And I realized that Luke being born the way he was was the greatest blessing we could ever have. Like God changed my perspective. In the midst of what I felt like was lost, God begins to bring it to bring about gain, to bring about growth, to bring about holiness and health in my life. God never wastes a difficulty, a trial, or a pain. He always turns them around and uses them for his gain. He doesn't always cause them, but he always uses them. God always uses them. And so today, I want you to hear this word. Some of you that have been crushed at the experience of loss, that God wants to bring comfort to you in so many ways that you could never even imagine. And right now, you just need a voice speaking into your life because you can't see it. You're under this weight. You're in the darkness. You're in the valley. And you can't see that there's another mountain just beyond it. You can't see it. And that's why God has people like me and friends to be able to come alongside you so you can see past the darkness to walk you out of the valley. God won't waste your valley experience, though. He will always use it for your gain. But he never leaves you there alone. His presence is his promise to us. Paul said this in the midst of one of the greatest difficulties of his life. He says, when I am weak, he is strong. It's this aspect that in Paul's greatest weakness, he felt like he couldn't carry on. He said in those moments, he felt strength like he could never produce in his own, in his own strength, in his own willpower. The strength of God is infinitely greater than anything else we've experienced. But we only experience the strength when our strength is run, run dry. When we are at our weakest, he is at his strongest. God wants to comfort you and, as we read the first few verses, bring peace and comfort and strength to you in the midst of your difficulty today. I believe that God brought every one of us here today to hear this word. He wants you to hear this today. That, it, that in the midst of your rejection, that God brings restoration. He, he wants you to hear today, in the midst of your failure, God wants to bring forgiveness. In the midst of you being crushed, with the pain of loss, God's there. And he wants to bring comfort to you in exactly the way that you need it. And it will never run dry. I want you to bow your heads with me for a moment as we, we kind of respond to what God's doing in this place. I, I believe that he's speaking. I believe that the presence of God is here. That God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is speaking to every one of our hearts. God is doing something. For all of us today, I want us just to think about drawing near to God. God, we acknowledge today the pain of loss. We acknowledge today the pain of rejection and the pain of failure. God, we pray over every situation that we've been dealt. Every weight that's upon our shoulders. Every relationship that's come and gone every word that's been spoken, every lie that's been told about us, our actions, or our identity. God, today, we pray for restoration. Lord, today, in the midst of our failure, we pray for forgiveness and freedom. 
Free us from unrealistic expectations. And God, right now in this moment, we call out the deepest pain of our life the loss that we've experienced, the loss that we're walking through, the valley that we're in, that we can, pro- we can try to put a smile on, we can try to act like we're not there, but God, we're there. We're empty. We are run dry. And God, right now in this moment, fill us up with your comfort. May we be full to overflowing with your love. And God, may you give us a day to dream again, to hope again, to have joy again. Restore to us the joy of our salvation that we we may walk in freedom, that we may walk in forgiveness, that we may walk in restoration of new life. Fill us up today. Your presence is so real, God. This life is so temporary, but God, your presence and your relationship with us is eternal. And so today we submit to you. We can't do this on our own, God. Be our good shepherd and guide us to greener pasture. Fill us up, God. Comfort us. We trust you today. Bring healing to our hearts and our minds. Heal the deepest wounds and scars right now, Jesus. As you continue with your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just one minute more, even those of you that are watching online, just for a moment, I want to speak to you because I'm talking about God bringing comfort, but I want to tell you the number one one way that God brings comfort is through His Son, Jesus. You see, we do sin, we do fail, and that creates a problem. It breaks our relationship with our Heavenly Father, but God wants to repair your relationship today. And He did it through Jesus. There's only one way to have a right relationship with God, and it's through the death and the resurrection of Jesus, our Savior. You see, He lived the perfect life that you and I should have lived. He represented us perfectly. And then He died the death that we should have died. He paid the penalty for all of our sin. And God's word says that if we call upon his name, trust in Jesus that he died and rose again and give our life over to him to make him Lord and master, then we can receive eternal life. We can be adopted into a new family. We can be forgiven of all of our sin. If you're here today or you're watching online and you want to yield your life to Jesus, believe in him and make him Lord, you want to do that today. I'm going to lead you through a prayer in just a moment quick, simple prayer. We're not going to call you out or do anything weird or or just try to embarrass you. We're not going to do that. But I want to help to lead you through a prayer to make Jesus Lord of your life this moment so that everything can change. You can have a new family. You can have a new start. If you're in the room, if you're online, just for a moment with no one looking around, if you're ready to give your life to Jesus and you know today that you want to do that, would you just slip your hand up and raise it? Nobody's looking around. Amen. Anybody else that says, that's me today. Amen. Amen. Anybody else that wants to do that, make that decision today to give your life to Jesus. Make him your comforter. Amen. Those of you that raised your hand and maybe you didn't and maybe you're watching online, let's pray together. God hears your heart. He knows what's going on in your mind. He's with you right now. Let's pray to our Father. Let's go. Dear God, I know that you created me. I know that you love me. But God, I've messed up. I have sin in my life that separates me from you. But I believe in Jesus. Jesus, I believe you died for me and you rose again. Jesus, I believe you love me. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Make me brand new. Adopt me into your family. Jesus, I'm all yours. Be the master and the Lord of my life. Help me to follow you from this moment forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome to the family today.